are made from very small things, and we live in a very, very big universe. And the small things are so small, and the big things are so big, that you might think we have no hope of ever understanding them. But I'm going to argue that, in fact, we already understand them quite well. It's the world in between the big and the small, the world we live in, that we don't understand. And in fact, that world is becoming harder and harder to understand, because we keep discovering more complexity and creating more complexity. And that's something we have to face if we want to solve our biggest challenges. But let's start in the beginning. I want to tell you how we came to understand the big. That's my background. I studied physics and cosmology. And it also has to do with where I grew up. I grew up in a town called Ylivieska in Finland, where you get about four hours of daylight uh, during the day. So when, whenever I walked home from school, it would be dark, and I would look at the stars. And it's the stars that really tell you how big the universe is. Stars are very big, as big or bigger as our sun, only very, very far away, and there are so many of them. Even with the naked eye, you can see 10,000 stars. Now, 10,000 is a big number, but it's still a comprehensible number. If each star was a grain of sand, 10,000 would be about three teaspoons of sand. So that's not so bad. But of course, we don't look at the stars with the naked eye anymore. We use telescopes. And already 100 years ago, around 1900, astronomers had good telescopes, and they could see over a million stars. Now, a million stars is a lot, but it's still a comprehensible number. It's about a bucket of sand. And in fact, uh, those astronomers were pretty sure that that was it, that there were about a million stars in the universe, um, except for these funny smudges they kept seeing in their photographs. And they called them spiral nebulae, and nobody knew what those were. And it took a computer to figure out what those actually were, a human computer called Henriette Leibitt, because back then, a computer was what you called a woman doing calculations for scientists. <laughs> now, Leibitt was paid $10 a week to analyze photographs of stars. And she was deaf, but she had a very, very good eye. And she spotted a pattern in the brightness of stars that gave her a new way to actually figure out how far away stars were. And she died of cancer very young, but was able to publish her finding, uh, but uh, couldn't see it applied. And it was Edwin Hubble who later said that Leavitt should have really won the Nobel Prize, who used her method to look at those spiral nebulae. And what he found was that they were much, much, much further away, millions of times further away than anyone had ever thought. In fact, they were galaxies. Galaxies just like our Milky Way, systems of hundreds of billions of stars. And we now know that the visible universe has hundreds of billions of galaxies. So it's not just a bucket of sand, it's not a million stars, it's seven times 10 to the power of 22 stars. Now again, if each star was a grain of sand, that would be all the sand in all the deserts and beaches and sandboxes on Earth times 10,000, 10,000 wells of sand. So in less than 100 years, that's how much our understanding of the universe has grown, from three teaspoons to 10,000 wells of sand. And actually, it's even worse, because Hubble showed that the universe is getting bigger and bigger. All those galaxies are moving away from each other at tremendous speed. So you may wonder, how could we ever figure out what was going on and what, 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 where all those stars came from? Now, fortunately, Einstein came along. And Einstein came up with a theory of relativity that says that space is really just distances between points. And those distances change depending on what you have between those points. He came up with equations that tell us how space itself changes when matter and energy move around in it. And his equations work extremely well. So well that all the phones uh, in your phones use GPS, which is based on Einstein's equations. And Einstein's equations predicted an expanding universe. And at first he thought uh, he'd made a mistake, but then he found out about Hubble's discovery. And we now know that the universe has been expanding for 13.8 billion years. That means it actually started out very, very small, smaller than an atom. And we call the moment the expansion started the Big Bang. Now, we still don't know exactly what happened at the very instant of the Big Bang, but thanks to Einstein, we do know how the universe got to be so big. And we know that little ripples, tiny little ripples in that early universe, grew with the universe into seeds that became stars and galaxies. So we do know where stars came from. 
Now, one of Einstein's equations had really big implications, not just for big things, but also for small things. And that's his most famous equations, E equals mc squared. What does that mean? Well, E means energy, m is mass, and c squared is speed of light squared. Light travels very, very fast, so c squared is an enormous number, almost as big as the number of all the grains of sand in the world. And that means that even the tiniest amount of matter, even an atom, has a tremendous amount of energy. So let's talk about atoms, and let's talk about small things. How small are atoms? Now, if you remember that tremendous number of stars in the universe, we have the same number of atoms in just three drops of water. So it's quite amazing that we can understand them all. And for a long time, we thought atoms were the smallest thing there was. But in 1898, Marie Curie discovered an element called radium. And radium was constantly radiating so much energy that it couldn't possibly come from reactions between atoms. And people got really excited about radium. Science fiction writer H.T. Wells thought that it could be a source of infinite power for a utopian society. Some people got maybe a little bit too excited and too carried away and started putting radium in products like chocolate and face cream and, and other things, something we now know wouldn't, wouldn't be a good idea. Now, Marie Curie uh, did something a bit better. She was able to use radium uh, to treat cancer, so she pioneered radiation therapy. But she herself got exposed to so much radiation that she eventually died of anemia. And even her cookbook, to this day, is harmfully radioactive. But she lived long enough to see what was really going on with radium. And she suspected that there might be something going on inside atoms, something that was converting matter into energy, like Einstein's equation implied. And she was right. In 1911, Ernst Rutherford took some radium, fired some of radium's radiation at a gold leaf, very thin gold leaf, and saw something really weird. The atoms were behaving like there was something much smaller inside, something compared to the size of the atom, like a grain of sand in the middle of a football field. And he had discovered the nucleus. The nucleus of an atom is made out of particles called protons and neutrons, orbited by a cloud of electrons. And to explain this structure of the atom, scientists had to come up with a new theory called quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics predicts that if you split the atom, if you split the nucleus, some matter will be converted into energy, and that's what was going on with radium. But Rutherford himself didn't think that atomic energy would be of any practical use. He famously said that anyone who looks for a source of power inside an atom is talking absolute moonshine. So, of course, there was a very stubborn Hungarian who decided that it had to be made to work. And he was called Leo Szilard, and he was born right here in Budapest. As a young man, he did a lot of work with Einstein, and they became close friends. What did they work on? Quantum mechanics, thermodynamics, theoretical physics. And they also invented a new type of fridge. Uh, Old-fashioned fridges used very poisonous gases, and a family in Berlin died of, of fumes coming, coming from those gases. And Einstein got really upset about it, and he was certain that there had, be a, had to be a better way to build fridges. So he asked Szilard for help to, to invent a better one. So they did. Um, it was a genius design, obviously, um, but uh, too expensive and, and too noisy to be actually practical. But in the end, they made some money by selling their patents to Electrolux. But Szilard kept inventing, and his next invention was something much, much bigger. In 1933, one morning in London, he was crossing the street at this spot, and just the moment when the traffic light changed, in a flash, he had a really beautiful and a really terrible idea. And he called it the chain reaction. If you could split just one atom that would release neutrons, that would split more atoms, that would release more neutrons, that would split more atoms, and so on and so on, you could make atomic power work. And you could also make a really terrible weapon. And that's exactly what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki 12 years later. Now, Szilard himself was horrified. He spent the rest of his life campaigning against nuclear weapons, and he switched fields from physics to biology. And the atomic bomb is a terrible thing. It shows that there is a dark side to our understanding of the big and the small. But actually, that same understanding triggered an even bigger explosion that's still going on today. And the trigger for that explosion was this. This is the first transistor. It's a device about this big. It was built by a team led by William Shockley in Bell Labs in 1947. And what it is, is the simplest building block of a digital computer. It can store a zero or a one. And like the atomic bomb, it's based on quantum mechanics, in fact, on equations worked out by another Hungarian uh, called Eugene Wigner, who was one of Szilard's friends as well. And Wigner showed that there are some materials that can be made to sometimes conduct electricity and sometimes not. So that gives you the one and zero. And one of those materials is silicon. 
And silicon is basically sand. So we make transistors out of sand, and we are now very, 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 very good at it. Here's a modern transistor. It's about 20 nanometers in size. And to give you an idea how small that is, all the 2 billion transistors in an iPhone 6 can be made from just two grains of sand. So in 1947, there was just one transistor. Today, there are 3 times 10 to the power of 21 transistors. That's 1,000 times all the sand grains in the world. And in just in 10 years, there will be more transistors than there are stars in the known universe. So we really have started another big bang. Now think about that for a minute. That's a number that applies not to atoms, but machines that we have made. What does it mean? It means we can see things that we could never see before. The Henrietta Leavitts of today don't have to do it all by hand. Computers are storing data and analyzing it for us. And just like telescopes revealed a much, much, much bigger universe, computers are revealing a world that is much more complex than we thought. And that world is around us and inside us. Let me give you an example. This is a human skin cell. So it looks pretty complicated. But thanks to computers, we can now read the code that runs it. We can read its DNA. And for a long time, scientists thought that only about 2% of that DNA did anything useful, and the rest was junk. But recently, we got much better at reading DNA. And now we know that that 98% is actually the control system for the cell. So in just a few years, we found out that the cell is actually at least 50 times more complex than we thought. Now, to give you an idea of what, how big a leap that is, let's think about it in terms of computer programs. A small iPhone app like, like Candy Crush is about 50,000 lines of code. So what 50 times more code give you? It would give you the control system for CERN's Large Hadron Collider, the most complicated science instrument in the world. So basically, we thought a cell was like Candy Crush, but it turns out to be more like the Large Hadron Collider in terms of complexity. So that means it's much harder to fix if something goes wrong. So it's no wonder that we are really far still from curing cancer. And maybe that's because we've been looking at that 2% we thought we understood. And to fix that, we really need to tackle the cell's full complexity. It's not just that we are just using transistors to discover complexity. We're using them to build complexity. We're putting them in every single device we build and connecting them all together. Now look at the internet in 1977 and then look at it in 2007. It's like a chain reaction. The more complex things we build, the more complex things they allow us to build. And now our transport networks, our financial systems, our energy systems are much, much more complex than ever before. And there's a problem with that because very complex systems can become fragile. And adding a single grain of sand to a sand pile can trigger an avalanche. And those avalanches are happening faster and faster. We're all familiar with the 2008 financial crisis. But in 2010, competing trading algorithms got locked into a feedback loop that created a trillion-dollar stock market crash in 45 seconds. It was called the flash crash of 2.45 p.m. Connections also mean that problems spread very, very quickly. Three billion people fly every year, and that means that the next pandemic we're going to have is going to be truly global. In a very complex system, you can also get cascading failures, one thing failing after another. This is the electricity grid of India. And in 2012, just one power line being overloaded crashed the entire grid and left 600 million people without power for three days. And sometimes connections can be very, very hard to see. Imagine a forest fire in Russia. What does that have to do with the Arab Spring? Well, forest fires in Russia led to the, a grain export ban, which caused massive financial speculation on food prices, which caused food riots in North Africa, and ultimately to people deciding they'd finally had enough. Our most difficult problems, like climate change, involve both the complexity of nature and the complexity we're cre creating. To fix clim climate change, we need to understand finance, we need to understand energy, we need to, need to understand soil and biology and the atmosphere and, and the oceans and quantum mechanics of carbon and light, all of those things at the same time. So we live in a world where most of what we think we know is wrong. Small things breaking means that big things break. And when things break, they break very quickly. Everything is connected, and we can't see those connections. And to understand anything, you have to understand everything. So that's a little bit scary. But there's no reason to panic. It's actually also quite exciting. For, for me, looking at all these complexities, to like looking at those stars again. And that's why I did what Szilard did and switched from physics to biology. There are amazing new opportunities if we can learn to live with complexity. And I think we can. And actually, we now have the means to make a lot of things much simpler. A lot of our systems, like finance and energy, are fragile because they have central nodes, like banks and power plants, that are connected to everything else. So what if we took those away? 
Think about technologies like solar power or Tesla's power wall, again, both powered by transistors. Maybe we can have power systems that are much less centralized and much more resilient. We might be able to do the same thing for finance. Bitcoin is an example of a platform that allows to have trusted transactions without a central authority like a bank that verifies them. But what about the complexity of nature? Now, cancer and climate change are so difficult problems that they might be too much even for an Einstein. But what about a million Einsteins all working together? Where could we find those Einsteins? Well, the chances are that a lot of those Einsteins are now playing computer games. And just all the hours spent on playing Angry Birds actually would translate into 12 Wikipedias every year. And actually, the best way to find the shape of a biological molecule is already a computer game called Foldit with 15 million players. There are other platforms like that, like Zooniverse, that mean that anyone can now try to find cancer mutations or new kinds of galaxies in huge sets of data. And we might even be able to apply that approach to politics. Iceland recently tried to crowdsource the drafting of the constitution via social media. And now you might think that was a terrible idea, but it actually worked out quite well. Uh, so there, there are ways to make democracy more transparent and have more brains working on problems that no single politician could ever understand. It may be that we have to give up some ideas about systems that we have, like the fact that we, we may not need to be able to understand them. Nature evolves systems without understanding them. At my company, Helix Nano, we're trying to build molecular machines that make writing genetic code easier using machines that we've evolved in a test tube and not designed. So, in a way, we can tackle complexity by accepting it and embracing it. And maybe ultimately the systems we build will merge with the systems of nature until we can no longer tell where one ends and one begins. Einstein said that things should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And that's a good rule for us to follow, both as a species and in our lives. So let's embrace complexity where we must, but find simplicity where we can. And this is the thought I'd like to leave you with. There's a name for the time in our lives where everything we think we know turns out to be wrong, where everything is too complex, everything is too overwhelming, and we don't know what to do. And it's called growing up. And that's when our adventures really begin. Thank you very much.